Look at this now. Woof. Up to 88% now say that they are enthusiastic about voting for Kamala Harris. All right, Kamala Harris may be on the wrong side of the American people on so many issues, but she's got enthusiasm behind her now. At least that's what we're hearing from polls and from the media who I think are sort of leading the charge in the enthusiasm. Here, take a look. Oh, the Democrats were suffering from low enthusiasm, so enthusiastic about voting. So this is Democrats for Biden or Harris. Look at this, back wow. in February, just 62% of Democrats said they were enthusiastic about voting for Joe Biden. Look at this now, woof, up to 88% now say that they are enthusiastic about voting for Kamala Harris. That is a huge jump, that is a 26 point jump. Look at Trump during the same stretch, Republicans for Trump. It was 80% in February, look, it's still fairly high at 82%. But compared to February, where Trump had this 18-point advantage, now we see Harris with a six-point advantage. It's definitely for Democrats. Game on. They are very enthusiastic. We see it in the money being raised. We see it in the volunteer signs. And now we're seeing in the polling as well. All yeah. right. So is the tail wagging the dog here? Is the much of this enthusiasm because the media is trying to generate the enthusiasm and not doing their job to ask tough questions? Or is this a genuine reaction for Democrats who, let's face it, recognize that Joe Biden had, at the very least, missed a step or two. We'll start with you, Angela. Is this a very real thing? I'm told in the New York Times today that the Kamala phenomenon, no, Kamala nominom, that's what they're calling it, which sounds like that song the Muppets used to sing, that it's real and it's tangible. And they're trying to do the Obama script all over again, it seems. Uh, if you follow the money, the Kamala nominon is real. She has brought in a massive fundraising haul, uh, far more than former President Trump has. That should be cause for concern for Republicans and conservatives. But you are right in that a lot of this enthusiasm isn't necessarily organic. It's being said, you know, um, this is the trend. Everybody's doing this. And of course, more and more people jump on the bandwagon, whether that uh, trend, quote unquote, is, is real or not. Uh, but I think Vice President Harris has very uh, strategically been in front of audiences only that are very excited about her. It's why the American Federation for Teachers or Federation of Teachers rather conference uh, last week was one of her first big campaign stops because she can reliably count on an audience there who loves her and she gets to talk about how much she loves them. She gets to run this very positive sounding campaign, even though it's incredibly negative for the American people. And because of that, it's easy for the media to point to that and say, oh, look, they all love her. Of course they do. She's never been in front of a challenging audience that may not agree with her on every single thing she says. Yeah, Akash, one of the polls leading into the uh, Republican convention was that the majority of Americans hoped that they had a uh, different choice you know i mean yeah sure you can choose between trump and biden who are you going to pick and they made their pick in those polls but given an alternative they wished they had different nominees well now they have their wish kamala harris gets to benefit from that that's exactly right I th and i think that's a lot of the enthusiasm you're seeing i mean yes is she at some level rebuilding the obama coalition on the left absolutely but i think that's a big part of it larry I, and i think Republicans should not kid themselves. I mean, if, if you think that Kamala Harris can't win this election because she's just like beyond incompetent and so far to the left, do not kid yourself. She absolutely can win this election based on the money, based on the enthusiasm and how this campaign is run and how the Republicans and the Trump campaign approach it. You do not want to be stuck in the middle of November screaming, scream, you know, stolen election again because somehow incompetent Kamala Harris won the election. Um, we've got to wisen up fast as far as how we go after her, the issues we attack her on, her track record, what we're telling the American people. And the other point that I would make, Larry, is that the importance of down ballot races just got way, way higher, right? Expanding the House majority and flipping the Senate. I mean, when President Trump was up by seven points on Joe Biden, people would kind of say, well, look, at least the top of the ticket might go in the Republicans' direction. That is far from a guarantee now, especially if she picks Shapiro for her vice presidential candidate. It all comes down to Pennsylvania obviously. Uh, so that might help them there. I think we've, again, got to wisen up, attack her on the issues where she's most vulnerable, which are the border and the economy, and pay close attention to those down ballot races, because neither Kamala Harris nor Democratic candidates are adequately being tied to Biden's track record. And we've got to start doing that fast as conservatives. Yeah, Elaine, it sort of brings up uh, the turnout factor, where uh, if you've got the shiny new thing now that excites you at least more than you know, Joe Biden did, uh, that's going to affect turnout, and that's now going to be an issue that Republicans need to pay close attention to, right? 
Absolutely. But turnout, um, if you dig a little deeper on what that means, it's turnout in the right areas. Uh -huh. um, and you should also remember that in 2016, uh, Trump was outspent by Hillary Clinton, who was, uh, you know, another coronated, you know, expected to win candidate. Um, outspent by two to one, and he still won because he was laser focused on the issues, and that's what he needs to do again. We actually think that whichever candidate wins the Hispanic vote is is the candidate who's going to win the election. That is becoming the largest voting block in this country. They continue to grow as a voting block. In 2020, Trump took 36% of the Hispanic vote. He's now polling at about 42%. Um, and if he can continue growing that um, set in specific areas. That's why we're in um, battleground states like Arizona and Nevada and Pennsylvania and Colorado in battleground counties to get out the vote, to register small business, uh, Hispanic small business owners working with Hispanic Christian churches in those battleground areas, and we can get the vote out there, we will win this election and Trump will win it. It doesn't take millions of votes. It doesn't even take hundreds of thousands of votes. We're talking just probably a few thousand votes in any of those battleground states. Well, and let me follow up with you with that, because I, I think you're right. I think the Hispanic vote is going to be sort of the, the hidden uh, story in this election. So let's tie that to enthusiasm. I think Republicans actually line up well with most Hispanic voters on the issues that matter most to them. How do you motivate them? Because their turnout in the past has not been very stellar as a voting group. How do you motivate the Hispanic voters to let them know how critical this election is for them? That's the point of the campaign. It's the Hispanic Vote Coalition. We're working with Bienvenido. Um, we're also working with um, an organization um, that is tapped into uh, about 40,000 Hispanic Christian churches. Um, yes, you're right. Hispanics believe in the same thing that non-Hispanic groups believe in. They believe in faith. They believe in family. They believe in freedom. And so what we're doing through this um, coalition is motivating them to vote their values. There's probably no other group that's been hurt more than this economy, than the Hispanic community um, with historic uh, inflation and high gas prices. Um, and, and education is very important to them. And of course, the border is still a big issue for them because the crime that is spilled over the border is coming into their communities and they don't like it. They're not happy with it and they will vote their values. We just have to motivate them to get out. Yes, you're right. The polls are looking good for Trump in this area, but polls do not necessarily translate to votes. And that's why we're working hard in battleground areas. Angela, uh, first, and then back to Akash. Angela, you just heard Elaine mention education. You used to be the spokesperson for the education department. That is, I think, again, one of those um, uh, stealth issues for Latino voters because a huge number of them are in the government-run school systems, and they're not very happy with where things have gone in the last few years. Can Trump reach those voters with some new ideas on education? He can reach those voters, he should reach those voters, but he doesn't necessarily need new ideas. He needs to lean on the education policies that he embraced during his first term, which were already working. It's things like education freedom for all, that you should that every parent deserves the right to choose where their child will go to school and how that child will learn, not based on their zip code, not based on their street address, but based on what that child needs. That is the common sense solution in education. And the more he drives that home, the better he's going to do with key constituencies, not just Latino voters. Actually, uh, some new polling data came out last week that said the only group, uh, when you line up political affiliation and race, the only group that opposes education freedom are white Democrats. Uh, minority Democrats are overwhelmingly in favor of school choice. So this isn't a partisan issue. It's a political one, certainly. But this is an issue that goes beyond party lines. And I think that any candidate would be right to embrace that. It's always right to do uh, the right thing for America's students and families. But it's also politically beneficial. Uh, the benefits of school choice are impossible to ignore. Uh, and also, there's another key voting block here, suburban women. There's nothing these people care about more than their kids. And that's wonderful. That's part of what makes America great is these strong families. So if the GOP drives home the message that your kids can't read and write and Kamala Harris and her union buddies are perfectly content to keep it that way, that is going to be very, very motivating uh, for all parents.
Yeah, I, those suburban women don't like mean tweets, though. So which one is going to overcome the other? Akash, I'm going to throw the hardest question to you here. Is this big enthusiasm push that we're now seeing in the polls for Kamala Harris, is it just the result of this little honeymoon she's enjoying? And it's just going to die out when things get real and it's going to be issue oriented. Or are they going to be able to sustain this whole personality play all the way to Election Day? I think your question includes a big if, which is when things get real. And when things get real, is Donald Trump going to be talking about the issues that are Kamala Harris's weakness? Or is he going to keep talking about the things that she's talking about and allow her to make the conversation about defining herself as a glass shattering candidate? Because that's what he's doing right now. Having this conversation about her background and how she got there and all that, it's playing into her hands. Now, we're talking a lot about these key constituencies, minority voters and suburban women. One of the sort of non-policy related things that these groups need to break from the Democratic Party is a permission structure, Larry, a social permission structure. Because right now in a lot of these groups, it's not popular to vote Republican. The way you create that permission structure is by talking about issues that they can go to their friends and neighbors and their community, other suburban women, other Hispanics and say, I'm voting Republican because of this issue. Yeah. The longer this, cam this campaign is not about issues, the harder that permission structure becomes. And so again, it's obviously important to attack around the issues, but there are very obvious political benefits for doing so among, as we've discussed, very, very small margins of groups that are needed to win swing states. Akash gets the last word, but a great go around there. We'll see if the enthusiasm continues. We know the media is going to try their best.